I, I don't think most people understand just how quickly machine intelligence is advancing. It's much faster than almost anyone realizes, even within Silicon Valley, and certainly outside Silicon Valley, people really have no idea. Um, if, if, there's, if there's a super intelligent, particularly if it's engaged in recursive self-improvement, if there's some digital super, super intelligence um, and its optimization or utility function is something that's detrimental to humanity, then it will have a very bad effect. Um, you know, it could be just something like getting rid of spam email or something, and it's like concludes, well, the best way to get rid of spam is to get rid of humans. Uh, actually, I think the thing to do would be to plot the progress of digital intelligence versus time, and and then to you know, maybe curve fit or extrapolate that progress uh, and see where that leads. Um, they have the intention of their utility function, but it can have unintended, unintended consequences. It, it's quite, it's more likely than not that if if there's some digital superintelligence apocalypse scenario. Um, it would probably follow people to Mars. Um, not necessarily, because because of that utility function, if it simply has a utility function that is arbitrarily confined to Earth, it, it would be totally fine doing that. The, I mean, it, it, this is... I think the, the reason for Mars... There's, there's two main reasons for Mars or becoming a multi-planetary. Um, I think one, one is the defensive reason. It's life insurance for life as a whole. Um, and this, there's some value to, to having that. Um, you know, it, 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 in terms of a small percentage of our economic output, like let's say half a percent or maybe even less of our economic output to ensure that, that the light of consciousness as we know it propagates into the future um, to, uh, for a much longer period of time. And, uh, you know, so there's that, that defensive reason. Um, and, and this is the first time in four and a half billion years in the, since Earth, you know, was first formed that it's been possible for life to move to another planet to become multi-planetary. Um, and that window may be open for a long time or it may be open for a short time. I'm actually quite an optimistic person, um, so I'm hopeful that it will be open for a long time, but maybe it'll be open for a short time, in which case we should take action now and, and not delay it. I'll, I'll just say the other reason, which I actually find personally more motivating with respect oh, to Mars, uh, which is that um, it would just be the greatest adventure uh, oh. ever um, and very exciting. And I think. We need things in life that are exciting and inspiring. It can't just be about solving some awful problem. Um, there have to be re reasons to get up in the morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, mean, I, th I think it, it is going to, from what I've heard of Oculus Rift and, and some of the other immersive technologies, that it's quite transformative. Uh, you really feel like you're there. Um, and, and then when you come out of it, it feels like reality isn't real. Um, so I think we'll see probably less physical movement in the future as a result of the virtual reality stuff. Well, I, I mean, there's some interesting things here on the virtual reality front. Um, and, I mean, just and on the whole notion of a simulation, which is that if, if you just, ex if you extrapolate into the future and say, well, how good, let's say, will video games be in, in 100 or 200 or 1,000 years from now, if, if there's continued improvement um, and you're in a full body haptic suit with a sort of surround vision and you know, you, it, 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 it becomes beyond a certain resolution indistinguishable from reality. Um, if, and, it, and there are likely, likely to be millions, maybe, maybe billions of such simulations. So then what are the odds that we're actually in base reality? Isn't it one in billions? So the, the, the uh, yeah, I mean, where we are right now is we've, I think, at, on the SpaceX front, we've made evolutionary but not revolutionary progress. We're hoping to make revolutionary progress in the coming years, um, but the key breakthrough that we'd aim for is, what they're aiming for is to be able to have the, the, the rocket booster come back and land. It's been expendable rockets uh, up till now, really, except, except for the, the, the space shuttle was partly reusable, um, but, but it was extremely difficult to re refurbish for flight. You needed 10,000 people needed to work nine months to refurbish the space shuttle. Um, so what, what we really need is uh, rapid and complete reusability, uh, like an aircraft or a car or really any mode of transport is, that, 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 that besides rockets, is um, reusable. 
you know, horse, bicycle, you can think of almost anything. Um, but imagine if that mode of transport was not reusable, so very, very unfortunate in the case of the horse. Uh, and, but, but even like in, in cars, like if you could use a car once, um, and you have to buy a new car every time you took a journey, odds are you would not buy many cars, because um, they would be very expensive. So it, it, reusability essentially it, uh, opens the door for re reducing the cost of space flight by a factor of 100 or more. Yeah, I mean, the beginning there was no government. Um, I, I funded SpaceX uh, entirely with the proceeds from PayPal. We got our sort of first government contract about five or six years after starting the company from NASA. Um, and, um, but, but I should say about NASA's maybe a quarter of our flights, uh, three quarters are commercial. I'm not exactly sure whether we're at the right number for basic research. I mean, I'm a fan of research, so I'd probably I'd be in favor of spending more money on, on that, uh, mm -hmm. allocating, allocating more resource, resources to, to, to basic research. Um, but, um, but I think the government's doing, doing quite a bit. I mean, NASA's doing, doing a lot of things. We've obviously got the, the rovers on Mars. Um, we've got the Hubble, things like the Hubble telescope, the upcoming James Webb telescope. Uh, there are planetary probes uh, and Earth science missions launching all the time. So NASA is doing, doing quite a lot. I, I'm not sure about the flying cars. I mean, it's not, that's not to say I don't think there should be flying cars. I mean, but if the sky was full of cars flying all over the place, then it was, you know, it would affect how, this, how things look. It would affect the skyline and, and uh, it would be noisier. Um, and there would be a greater probability of something falling on your head. You know, those are, those are not good things. On the other hand, uh, that you could be able to go from one place to another faster. But I think actually, if, at least for, you know, if you eliminate the choke points in cities, then there's really not that much traffic outside of the choke points. So you look at sort of, in suburban streets, you don't see a lot of, uh, I mean, you're, you're, the traffic doesn't, doesn't choke things. Um, it's really on the highways and major arteries, and it's because the, the, the cities grew way bigger than the but Tesla is going to do a stationary storage of, you know, in, in a very large-scale way because it's it's very important to pair battery packs with solar power and and for wind it's even more important. Uh, so with with the Gigafactory that we're creating in Nevada, we're going to create many, well, probably tens of gigawatt hours per year of stationary storage um, on the battery front. So that yeah, there's a lot coming for sure. Things seem to be going, you know, fairly well in, in China. We've had a very enthusiastic response, and um, yeah, I think I think long term, it, it seems likely that China would be the biggest market for Tesla. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm really really optimistic about uh, things over there. It seems likely that um, it you know it would likely be bigger than North America. Yeah, in the long term, um, the, the government's been pretty good. I mean, there's. There is certainly, um, in terms of the incentive structure, it does favor local production, but overall it's, um, you know, I, I, th I think it's not been too, too much of an issue. Um, the, the, the government's been, been great so far. I, I, this may sound trite, but I, I think, I honestly think tunnels should be given a lot more consideration. Um, so, that, I mean, if you look at a city, you, you, if you have, you look at, I can, we have all these apartment buildings and office buildings, and they are on many levels. Like they're, you know, could be like an average of, in Manhattan, I don't know what is an average of like 30 stories or something like that, but then you've got a street, which is one story. This is an obvious issue. <laughs> like you have a 30 to one ratio of, you know. Yeah, and you can have tunnels to, the tunnels don't have to follow the, the buildings. They can, they can be, they can go diagonally. Through the basement, yeah. Yeah, and you can have as many levels as you want. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, the, it's really just the cost of building the tunnels, um, and um, but really, it's, a tunnel's a hole in the ground. Like, how hard can it really be? I mean, it seems like if, if some entrepreneurs put their effort into building tunnels, yeah, I mean, it's it, it, with within cities, it's sort of tunnels and tubes, uh, and I mean, for, for long distance travel, I really think that the vertical takeoff landing, electric supersonic aircraft, is the way to go. Um, and um, I think it's, it's very doable.